I am a woman. I am a social museum staff member, and I am a teacher in the Jordan's and I am a children's professors. And I am a teacher. I am Matthew George, and I am also a teacher. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. So the quick slide is an overview, kind of why, like Laura said, we've been really working on this at TLC uh, and why it's important and why it matters for all of us and, um, and, and staff too. And then definitions of DEI. Beck is gonna walk us through some, some, some wonderful definition. And then we have some fun activities planned. Um, that you could use with like your students in your tutor room or elsewhere um, in your classroom or however you see fit to use it. It's really fun. And then we're just gonna have a little closing and reflection and hopefully in an hour. Um, so yes. Um, okay, so just some disclaimers. Of course, we've been working hard on this, but we do not claim to be experts at this. I think this is always something that everybody is learning and kind of working on and it's, um, it's an ongoing thing. Um, everyone has room to learn and grow. Um, it, we're only talking about TLC here tonight. Um, and then this will not be a how-to guide, just kind of some thought, putting some thought into it and kind of thinking how you can apply it. Um, no end goal. And then just, yeah, the purpose of the training is to reduce harm to our participants on their programs, so just make it um, a place, which I think everybody here really does, which is great. Okay, and then if you look in your packet, there's something that is called community guidelines. I don't know if everybody got a chance to look it over, um, but we think all of these are very important for this conversation, definitely. Um, how we want to steer the conversation and want everybody to feel comfortable. So I don't know if anybody looked at this and found something that they thought was really important or wanted to point out um, quickly for the whole group. So I can go ahead and look through them. I really like the community guideline about speaking from an I perspective. So if there's something that you want to share, speaking from a personal point of view, I think is a great place to start. Um, Can you speak up louder? Yeah. yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. I said, I really, <laughs> I really like the bullet point about speaking from an I perspective. So Speaking from a personal point of view, if you have something to bring to the conversation, starting from um, something that you understand and relate to because it's your own identity and point of view. And I really like, if you look on the second page, there's the ROPES acronym. And I feel like that kind of sums up a good like summary of kind of how we want this conversation to go and just be an open and safe um space for everybody to learn share um and a really fun time so anything else about the community guidelines that you can think about yes i think this is really interesting is this to show all the diverse Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So the wheel, yeah, there's the wheel on there as well. Um, and so that is for, you know, it's also something that you could do in your in your with your students. Um, and it's just kind of a way to think about yourself, you know, the like how you see yourself and then sharing it with others, um, and kind of diving deeper into that conversation too. Um 
So if there's anything else about the community guidelines or agreement, I'm going to pass it off to Becca. So thank you. <laughs> I don't think I introduced myself yet, but my name is Becca and I use she, her pronouns also. Can you hear me? Yeah, will you like raise a hand if you can't hear me? Um, okay, so we have some discussion questions that we want you to talk about um, with the people at your table. And these are based off of the readings that you did. So if you have those readings, that's great. If not, uh, and you have questions, you can raise a hand um, and we can come around and give you some background on some of those things. But if you want to choose one or two of these questions to kind of discuss with the people next to you at your table, we'll give you five minutes for that. Um, okay, y'all, I'm sorry, I am not a planner of this workshop, and I'm just kind of jumping in to do the Zooming, so, hey, I think you guys might not have had those agreements, and I'm sorry, I think the plan is to email them all around afterwards, and I just can't quite get the signal to anyone right now to get that PDF. Um, but I think we could dive into these discussion questions here as a little Zoom group. Um, and I feel like I probably have a ton of background noise, so I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm the biggest mess of all time. But um, just in thinking how this work is relevant to Teton Literacy Center, I mean, we serve such a diverse population in town um, across many demographics. So I really think as we try to make TLC a home to so many folks, um, this work is really important.
I'm not really sure how we're doing this. Are we, are we just speaking out, Cressa? <laughs> I also apologize if I'm not really sure how we're doing this. I think at our next discussion point, let's either speak out or we can share via the chat. Um, or if it okay. seems simpler, we could go into breakout rooms. I feel like I also have a lot of background noise for Zoom to kind of host some of these conversations. We just are not well set up for hybrid, so I apologize. No, no, but you're perfect. I think I was just confused. <laughs> I feel equally confused. <laughs> Okay, um, I would love to hear if anyone wants to share some key takeaways about some things that you talked about. And I also want to empower people if you can't hear me very well and you want to move forward as I'm presenting, even if you decide later, that's okay. Um, so there's some space up here too, if people need. Um, but I would love to hear what you all discuss in your group. Any key takeaways or things that you'd like to share? We discussed the uh, 1950s Boys Light magazine cover, uh, Boys Will Be Boys. And we were talking about it in our own experience. Obviously, the ladies here had a different experience in terms of how that was exactly versus I was. Although I will say, I could remember that and being very upset. My mother taught me that that was really kind of insulting. Uh, and it was used too often as an excuse for bad behavior. Which my mother would not tolerate at all. Yeah. <laughs> but she didn't know. <laughs> but I, you know, we were also discussing in terms of how relevant is that today? How is that slow to know? I can't think of my kids or, or our grandkids using that statement. And I, I'm not sure how, I'm sure it's still relevant to some degree today, but just my personal experience with the three of us that. We're really not sure how relevant that is. Is it used to excuse Tom? Um, Do you have something to uh, I do in the sense of I think that in today's culture, it's probably not spoken, but it's still very, very much sometimes experienced. That's um, for for people. And I also first thing that glaringly stood out to me that maybe as a younger person would not have stood out is that there's zero diversity in that poster. Everyone looks just like me. <laughs> I think those are great points. Anything else anyone wants to add to that conversation around this picture? I think I definitely see um, what both of you are saying, I think, is a great question around like, are these slogans, are these things still prevalent today? And maybe if showing up in a different way, yeah. then maybe it showed up, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and I think that that's a great conversation. And what are those differences so that we can continue to kind of recognize when we're justifying that same, those same behaviors, but maybe using different language? Um, so I think those are great. Any other key takeaways people want to share from their discussions? Yes. Slightly related. Um, when I was a librarian here, I remember putting books up on display a lot, and I tried to have diversity show. Like I just used, we didn't have any of the teams back then. We will have a bit. Um, but I did think of black characters, and um, they never got picked. Never, nobody, they were up there for like a month now. The only, and Jackson's a wasp, you know, and the, not so much now, but it was really bad back then, back then, if it was. And um, I was just, when I go to the library still because I do story times for different places and I pick books, and now I see such a change in what is um, displayed, and I'm so excited about it because obviously it wasn't books that are being taken. And, there's, you know, books, LBG, YouTube, books, etc. Um, on display, and they're coming down, and I was picking a book to read to kids, and there were two fathers in the story, and um, it was just like, wow, this is great. And so I know there's such a change. I think that's a great point. Did somebody else 
is somebody trying to do that? Um, and I also think that what you bring up about how maybe those books weren't chosen at the time, but now they're being chosen is also a great thing to acknowledge. And, you know, we are seeking to do the same thing, and I'll talk about this later, to diversify our book collection at TLC. And I think it's important to diversify the collection so that it represents like the general population, not just our community here, um, because it's important to learn about identities that are not our own too. Um, so I think that that point around like, maybe people weren't choosing it and now they are, is ho hopeful to me that people are interested in learning about each other and our differences and our identities and where we have our own. But Debbie, wouldn't you say probably back in the time that you're referring to, it wasn't that we didn't have the books out there. The books didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, there was, you know, our characters were all, you know, white, middle class, you know, and then you, you might occasionally have a kid whose family went to a divorce. You know, that was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I just think that we've come so far, not we, the people who are doing writing have come so far because they're offering this threat of literature that I know wasn't around. I think that's a great point. And it speaks to also like some of our classics that we view as like books that are held in really high regard, sometimes don't show that same diversity that we now see when you walk into a bookstore or the library. Um, and so also understanding that when students who maybe don't share that identity of being white and privileged and um, having socioeconomic privilege, having um, being male, having, two mom, uh, having a mom and a dad, um, I think not being able to see yourself in the literature um, is really challenging. So the fact that now we do have those books is really important and we're working as a staff to kind of figure out like how can we make sure that they're at TLC. Yeah. Those are great points. Any other thought, thoughts before we move into some definitions? I just think that word witnessing is one we probably don't, we're not as conscious of as, you know, consistently as we probably need to be as humans, that the role of witness in a, uh, an unloaded sense, just simply the observer. Um, it, it, it's just all part of that, you know, that greater awareness and listening process and, and learning process that so was in there that it sort of I think it's a really strong word that uh, listening witness witness yeah it's a great thing <laughs> okay um so we're gonna move into some definitions um and we're gonna share kind of what are a lot of these words being used around in the kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion world. What do they mean? What are some examples of these things? Um, and I want to reiterate, I'll be talking a lot, kind of explaining what these words are, but again, I am not an expert, um, and this is not the end of anyone's DEI learning journey, including my own, um, and I want this to be a space where we can learn from each other, um, and so let me know if you have any thoughts or questions as I'm speaking, um, and I'm going to start with some terms that were introduced in the pre-work readings that we sent to you all. Okay, so the first definition is privilege, which is special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. Um, you can see some examples here on the right. Um, and this is an unfair, unfair advantage granted to somebody based on an identity trait that they have. Um, it's not helpful to necessarily feel guilty. Um, sometimes that is an initial reaction that we have. Um, I think in our reading, it spoke specifically to white privilege. There are other forms of privilege as well. I hold privilege for being white, for being a citizen, for being cisgender, which means that I identify with the gender um, that I was assigned at birth. 
Um, so acknowledging where you hold privilege is really important. And it also doesn't take away from where you don't hold privilege. Um, so for example, I am Jewish. I don't hold re religious privilege. When I'm walking into a store, um, I don't see my holidays represented in that store. I can't buy things for Rosh Hashanah or Hanukkah in this town. And that's a reality for me. But when I'm in those stores, I still hold white privilege. Um, I am not afraid that somebody is perceiving me as a criminal because of the color of my skin. I am not um, afraid that somebody is judging me because of the color of my skin. So I am experiencing white privilege. Um, and that's an advantage that I've been given unfairly for no other reason than the fact that my skin is white and that it's perceived as like an expectation and norm in some of our systems. Um, so holding privilege is not inherently a bad thing, but what you do with it matters. Um, how can you use your privilege to advocate for those who don't hold those same privileges? So for me, that looks like questioning and pushing systems to change where whiteness is an expectation um, and people who are um, viewed in other ways are other. And so I think that's kind of the biggest thing for me is like, what can we do to change some of these norms and expectations so that people who do hold these privileges now um, aren't the only people seeing these advantages and we're making this an equitable space for people. The next um, definition is stereotype threat, which is a situ situational predicament in which people are or feel themselves to be at risk of conforming to stereotypes about their social group. Um, it's theorized to be a contributing factor to long-standing racial and gender gaps in academic performance. So in the reading that we sent everybody, they gave lots of examples. And I'll give an example that they kind of gave later on in the book, um, just so I'm not being repetitive, but also in case others didn't um, have time to do that reading. Um, so they did a study where they gave a group of women a math test. Um, and in giving that math test at the very beginning before they handed out the test, they made a statement about how their results were in some way contingent upon their gender identity. And because there's this perception, um, maybe not something that's spoken out loud, kind of to your point earlier, I'm not sure if this is something that's talk about, talked about or just ingrained into our systems, um, but there's a perception that girls aren't good at math. So when there was a statement made before they give, gave them this math test about how their results were somehow <clears throat> contingent upon their gender identity, the group of women did worse on the test. So it affects their academic performance um, because of this way that they were being perceived um, or that they thought that they were being perceived. So if that statement hadn't been made, they did another test, their results were better. Um, and the book gives examples of this in lots of different um, types of identities. And I think identities which are systemically oppressed and marginalized likely experience these stereotypes really frequently and more frequently than some other folks. Um, I think a thing that the section that you all read did a really good job of is um, they kind of talked about this impacts everyone. Um, so we wanna learn about how is this impacting people so that we can move away from making these stereotypes and help to actively counteract them to prevent the harm that's being done. Um, I think an example with this at TLC um, is we predominantly serve Spanish speaking students. Um, so one of the things that we wanna do is counteract the stereotype threats that our students might be experiencing um, and might be in play for them within the education system. So one of those that comes to mind for me is invisible and sometimes visible language hierarchies in our school system. Um, so we don't want to, our students to see that them knowing Spanish or speaking Spanish is a deficit in any way. We, want, we don't want them to feel like they're missing something because their first language wasn't English. We want them to view the strengths that they have as being bilingual students as a strength and to see how that really contributes to them being like amazing people in our community, amazing students, and it brings so much to the table um, in our community. Okay, so then 
we're going to go into some definitions around bias. Um, this is kind of a general definition of bias, and then we'll get into some different types of bias as well. Um, but it is a tendency, inclination, or prejudice toward or against something or someone. Um, and we all have bias. No one is immune to it. Um, sometimes our body uses it in really helpful ways. So for example, if somebody's sick and you don't want to get sick, you might move away from them. That's a bias. Or if something you've seen um, ha as having been dangerous before and then associating that thing with danger in the future, that's also a bias. So there are times where it is helpful in our lives and it's the way that our brains process things. Um, it causes a problem when it causes harm to other people, which is where we're trying to kind of interrupt this. Um, so we're working to move away from these assumptions that are sometimes made. And I think one example of this in our program is sometimes people who are new to TLC programs or haven't been involved for very long will assume that our students, because they are Latine or because they are in our programs, they don't read at home or they don't value reading in their households. And I think that this is not true. We have done surveys with our families and a lot of families really highly value storytelling, really highly value reading. And so we want to interrupt this um, bias that people have and kind of show people like reading and storytelling is so important to a lot of our families. It's different for everyone, just like as everything. We're all independent human beings. Um, so it depends on who you are, but we kind of want to interrupt this narrative because um, we see that that's not true. Um, and I think another thing to point out is that it's the system that we're trying to improve. So why, why are our students at TLC? How can we change that system so that they are feeling supported and valued um, at TLC and in the school district as a whole? So one specific type of bias is conscious or explicit bias. And this is a bias that you're aware of. Um, so one example that I can give you in my own life is I think that, and a lot of teachers I think probably have this, um, I'm aware that I am lesson planning in the way that I wanted to learn as a child. Um, so my lesson plans reflect how I wanted to learn as a little kid. I'm aware of that bias, so I am actively working to make my lesson plans inclusive for all of the different ways that my students learn and trying to figure out how do all of my students learn and how can I make sure that I'm meeting all of those needs. And then another type of bias is unconscious or implicit bias. So this is a bias that you are not aware of. It's operating outside of your awareness. Um, so an example for me here is I mentioned that I was Jewish. I think oftentimes a lot of people will assume that I celebrate Christian traditions and holidays because that is the expect expectation and the norm. Um, so people will give me the same greetings that they give their Christian friends, or people will assume that I'm on the same calendar that they're on. And one example of this is Rosh Hashanah is the most important Jewish holiday. It's the Jewish New Year. And oftentimes meetings um, are scheduled on that holiday, or I have work on that holiday. And for some reason, it's hard for me to take that day off. But people don't know, like you, you can't know what you don't know. Um, so that's why it's important for us to kind of spend time learning about each other's identities so we can recognize like, Ani can be like, oh, hey, it's Rosh Hashanah this month. Like maybe Becca might want that, that day off of work. Um, so the goal here is kind of trying to seek an understanding instead of making assumptions. We obviously can't know everything, but I think the biggest thing here is just to try to um, listen to people when they're kind of talking about things and the way that they affect them. And then the last type of bias is affinity bias. So it's unconscious tendency to trend towards people who are like us. Um, again, this type of bias is not inherently harmful. Um, we feel safe and included by people who understand us. So I want you to kind of do an exercise in your head and think of three of your closest friends. And maybe put a hand on your head when you have them. Um, and now I want you to think of those people and think about whether or not they share your gender, race, first language, and sexual orientation. 
And I think for a lot of people, the answer is yes, obviously not for everyone, but I think this is just to point out that this, again, not always harmful. We want to be understood. We want to be around people who relate to us, but it can be harmful when it excludes people or there's a power dynamic involved. So an example of that is like, if there was a group of um, three wealthy white men on a hiring committee um, and they, their affinity bias in the hiring process was then to hire the person who was also a rich white male. Then that's continuing to exclude other communities from that workplace and also um, maintaining this like power and control for that one group of people. Okay, so the next word is diversity. Um, and this is the differences between us based on which we experience advantages or encounter barriers to opportunities. Um, and I like this definition because I think it doesn't just talk about difference, but also specifically how you experience barriers or advantages based on those differences. And I think why this is important to me is because our identities matter. So if we take a look at this identity iceberg, you have you know, your visible identity traits and the identity traits that are not visible. And all of those things really come, to, come into play and impact the way that we see the world and the way that people see us, um, which is important. And I think how diversity used to be taught in school is kind of this picture with the eggs um, and showing that there are two different colored eggs, but on the inside, they're the same. And I think we're trying to move away from this because it's important to understand how our differences impact the things that we experience and the way other people view us. It does impact our everyday lives. So ignoring those um, differences does a disservice to people. Um, I think a few things to note, kind of disclaimers on this slide. Um, one is that a single person cannot be diverse. Diversity speaks about like a group of people. Um, and also the barriers that somebody might experience are exist as a product of our environment. Um, so we wanna work to change that environment. It's not, on the, it's not the, um, on the person to change themselves so that they don't have to experience those barriers. We wanna change our environment. So some examples here um, at TLC, we received a DEI book grant last year, which is really exciting. Um, and so we are purchasing a variety of different books about students who experience the world in lots of different ways. Um, so that's one thing that we are working on doing is diversifying our library. Um, and we noticed a need for more Spanish books in our library. A lot of our students go to Munger and they read books in Spanish at school and wanted to read books in Spanish at TLC. So we were like, this is a need. This is something that we're gonna try to improve on. So we're trying to use some of that money and some other money to purchase more books in Spanish. And I think an important thing here is that we want our books to be inclusive um, of our students, of our community in Jackson, and also of the general population. We're sending our students out into the world and our goal is to kind of educate them to interact with other human beings as they get older. And so our goal here is to kind of try to um, embody the diversity that we see in, in this country and in this world. Um, okay, so I think these words often kind of get confusing um, looking at the differences between them. So I, I wanna ask you first, in the picture of inequality, uh, what are some things that you notice? Yeah, and uh, I think it represents privilege because there's just two kids kind of hanging out and one just gets thrown the apple and the other one's wondering why they're not getting thrown the apple. And neither one of them is doing anything. Yes, I think that's a great point. Um, no one did anything for that kid to receive that apple. It's kind of what we were talking about before of like it's the environment, the barriers that we experience our products for our mind. And then if we look at the quality, what are some things that you notice in that picture? Yeah. 
And then with equity, what are some things that have changed with what you notice? I think it's interesting that you know, the tree is the system, right? So it's leaning and leaning and leaning, and equity allows the higher ladder, but the system is still unjust, mm -hmm. you know. So um, equity isn't adequate, which yeah. It's I, I think we don't talk about that as much as we need to. Yeah. Um, equity is not enough. It's better than equality, but it's not there yet. I love that point. I think, yeah, justice is our goal. And sometimes in the meantime, we need to make things equitable as we're working towards changing those systems. Um, but we need to also be working towards changing those systems. Any other things people want to share about what they notice in these pictures? I guess following up on what you were saying, the justice is they fix the system. Mm -hmm. the yeah. I think if you wanted to go deeper on the justice, I don't think those two tiny humans were able to make that tree to be more balanced. It probably took some mm -hmm. additional external work. That's um, such a good point. Yeah. I think that's really that. important to realize that the system of change is a bigger level of buying. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll give another example. So, Carissa, what shoe size do you wear? Eight. An eight. I also wear an eight. Anya, what shoe size do you wear? Nine. Nine. Floral. What shoe size do you wear? Seven. So, the four of us, well, we wear the same shoe size. But say I was, get, I was buying shoes for everyone, and I said, well, I wear a size eight, so I'm going to buy size eight shoes for everybody. But Carissa and I would be the only ones who would fit in those shoes. Anya and Laura would be out of luck. Um, and so I think that that's like a really kind of, it helped me to um, visualize the difference between equality and equity as we can't give everyone the same thing because human beings are different. And just like those shoes wouldn't fit all four of us, um, there are systems and the way, ways that we do things that don't fit every person's needs. Um, an um, example in relation to TLC is that all of our resources are distributed in Spanish and English. I think inequality would be only giving resources to parents who spoke English. Equality would be giving um, those resources to everyone, but only in English. Um, right now, we're working towards equity, giving everyone um, the resources in the language that they speak. But I think it's also a larger conversation around justice. How can we change these systems? so that they are equitable and resources are ab abundantly accessible for everybody, no matter what language that they speak. Um, any questions on any of these things so far? Okay, so now um, inclusion is fostering a sense of belonging by centering, valuing, and applying the voices, perspectives, and styles of those who experience more barriers based on their identities. Um, and I really love this definition because I think it specifically speaks to centering those people who do experience more barriers. And I think that's really important. We need to amplify those voices. Um, and one way that we did that tonight um, is by going around and sharing our gender pronouns at the very beginning of the night. Um, so I think this gives, there's a few reasons that this is um, a good thing to kind of establish as a norm. One is that it, norm, it normalizes and explains that not everybody's um, pronouns correspond with how they look. Um, so when we are asking people to share their pronouns, we're giving people the space to self-identify and to tell you what, how they want to be, um, how they want to be referred to. Um, and so I think that that is one way that we can amplify the voices of um, people who are experiencing barriers. So even if you have a group of students who all 
identify as cisgender, asking students to share their pronouns is a really good way of centering inclusion. Um, another way that we're working to center inclusion at TLC is we have just established a parent advisory committee. Um, so I think our staff is predominantly white women. Um, I, there's a lot that I don't understand about the families that we serve. Um, so we want to hear from the voices of the families who are coming to our programs and we want to know what do they need for our programs to be successful. So we're establishing this parent advisory committee to hear from our families. Um, what, what do you think would help our programs to be more successful? What can we implement? What can we do differently? Um, and then I think the last thing here is it's not somebody's job who is experiencing um, barriers or wh whose identity is marginalized to teach us about themselves. Um, we can do our best to read books by people who have different identities than we do, um, to listen to people who are talking to us um, that have different opinions than we do. So I think the biggest thing with all of this is just seeking information and understanding when people are talking to you and in the reading and learning that you're doing. Okay, we're almost done with the definition section. We've got two more. Um, cultural competency is a person's ability to interact effectively across various dimensions of diversity, essentially our will and actions to build understanding. This is a term that used to be widely used in nonprofits and I think is still widely used in a lot of nonprofits, but it's something that we're trying to move away from for two reasons and I'll give you a different term um, in just a second. But I think one problem with this term is that it assumes that there's categorical knowledge that a person can attain about a group of people. So your learning doesn't end. Um, it's something that we're constantly working on and trying to listen to other people. Cultures change, people change. Um, and people within cultures are different. Um, so this is something that we want to work on continuing to um, kind of move with as people to just new things. Um, and then also it kind of denotes that there's an end point to becoming fully culturally competent. And again, there's no end point, we're all learning. Um, this is a process. So the word that I, I actually just learned this word um, is this term, cultural humility. Um, and this is a person who is aware of and sensitive to historic realities like legacies of violence and oppression against certain groups of people, a dynamic and lifelong process of focusing on self-reflection and personal critique, acknowledging one's personal biases. Um, so I think what I love about this is it's on kind of the, per the individual themselves to um, do some self-understanding and work on your own self-awareness. Um, and we can make an effort to seek understanding, but we're not experts. So that's what I love about that. I think some ways that I have been working on my own cultural humility, one of them in relation to TLC, there are students um, whose names I don't know how to pronounce sometimes when they come in to our programs. Um, so something that I've learned since working here is that I need to ask, um, and then I need to work really hard to get it right. Um, and I think this is an expectation that we have of volunteers and community members as well, is that people will ask our students how to pronounce their names and then work to pronounce them correctly. Um, and if you have questions, you can always ask staff to support you. And then another example of cultural humility is, as I was giving this presentation, I had the term Latinx written in a lot of my slides. And I was practicing with a friend and this term is in an effort to um, de-gender the word Latino, and the O um, signifies that the word is masculine. Um, and my so the Latin X moves away from that, which was why I was using it. Um, and my friend interrupted me and said, oh no, I actually really prefer the term Latine. And Latinx is a term that was created in the US um, as an, an, Eng an, is an English-centered term. And she said, Latino was created by LGBTQ, plus Spanish speakers. And so that's the term that I would prefer. And so I think this is just a really good example of like, I'm learning um, when somebody tells me, I say thank you and then change my language moving forward. Um, so I think in terms of cultural humility, it's a, it's a process. 
um, and not an end point. So um, this is kind of a summary of some of those terms, but inclusion is what we're working towards. I think it's something that we're actively trying to work on um, at, in our community to affect diversity and representations, representation, which is the outcome. Um, equity is kind of how we're working to do it. Um, and cultural humility is what we need to do as well. Um, I know that's a lot of information. So thank you for listening. Um, does anyone have any questions, thoughts? And then all these questions are in your packet as well. Mm -hmm. um, a little list of those if you're like need a refresher, but um also literacy, like families, students, like staff, volunteers that we have some passion to help. Uh, and then Anna is going to kind of throw it out to, we do have a few activities. I know I want to like be cognizant of everybody's time. Um, so if you guys keep going, um, but Anna is going to talk through these activities that she made and if you'd like to stay in Mabel afterwards. I'm just so thankful that so many people came. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really had no idea. We were like, five people could come. But we just, we have no idea. So I'm just so thankful that everyone is part of that with our other and I really do understand if you have to go. We are at the end of the hour. Um, we had imagined that we would have some time to do some care activities like we would do with a student. All of these can also be adjusted to the large group if that's the setting you're used to. Um, and you've also been given all of these little, we call them blurbs, but we put in our lesson plans. Everyone's been given the blurbs in your packet or there's some extras there. So you're welcome to just take that home and look through it. You can walk through here and look at what we've got. This is like, ideally, if you were going to do this activity, this is what you would find in your tutor box or like given to you to students. So you're welcome to look through it, do it with somebody if you'd like to, um, or else you're free to go. Before you go, there is a blank sheet of paper um, just for some time to reflect on the back of that packet that we printed out. Um, and the question that we kind of wanted to throw out there, if you want to reflect kind of on this whole conversation, is um, something new that you learned or something that you're grateful that you learned today. Um, and then, and or um, how you can utilize this and implement this at CLC. And then, you know, if you are thinking, your everyday life as well. So just kind of take some time to reflect. Thanks everybody so much for coming. And then rip those off and give them to one of the Thanks everybody. And thanks Anna and Olga. Hey, if anyone wants to stay and kind of work through this lesson um, activity, and I can split us into some breakout rooms. Um, if you need to head out, I certainly understand that it's dinner time. So I'm happy to do whatever works for you. And thank you for your patience with my Zoom hostessing. I was not. Prepared. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad it was helpful um, to you, lady. Thank you for being here. Bye, Alex. Bye, Tessa. Bye, bye. Um, did this feel good for you, JHCM ladies? I feel like it's probably all really already in your wheelhouse, but a good refresher. Yeah, it was definitely good. It's always good to be refreshed <laughs> and reminded. Um, and then, Carissa, I 
don't need it now, but I'd love to look at it tomorrow. Um, I just requested access um, for the lesson. Okay, perfect. And I think Anna has power on that, of course. Okay, cool. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're doing great. Thank you so much for <laughs> leading me. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really good note for when we do these the next time, like a little, uh, being a little more prepared to facilitate on Zoom. Um, but luckily, most of it was Becca talking, which I feel like was much more conducive. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, we will make sure you get that. And yeah, thank you, ladies, both for your time and energy and being here. Thank you, Carissa. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Sounds thank good. you. Sorry, I'm at basketball, so it's really loud here, but thank you. <laughs> You're all good. That mom life. Thank you for zooming in. <laughs> Bye, ladies.